well, we'll oh, it, is, it will open the session by singing in Psalm 115. Singing from verse 10. And we'll sing to the end of the psalm, Psalm 115. O Aaron's house, trust in the Lord, their health and shield is he. He that fears God, trust in the Lord, their health and shield he'll be. The Lord of us hath mindful been, and he will bless us still. He will the house of Israel bless, bless Aaron's house he will. Psalm 115, from verse 10 to the end, O Aaron's house, trust in the Lord. Now, this uh, session is uh, going to be a sort of informal discussion, and what's going to happen is that uh, I'm going to talk to Mr. Macaulay, rather Mr. Macaulay's going to talk to me, and you're going to pick up what he's going to say on the public address system because it's switched on, and what we don't want you to hear will switch it off. <laughs> you won't hear it. Now, one of the penalties that the conference committee have paid for the success of the running of each conference in the past seven years is its steady growth and uh, consequently we're not able to meet in the informal surroundings of the lounge next door and so uh, it's very difficult in this kind of setup to have uh, an informal meeting and an informal discussion but uh, this is really what is going to be as informal as we possibly can make it in the hope that uh, as the meeting unfolds in the next 40 minutes or so, that uh, we may be able to get some kind of contribution from yourselves and uh, what Mr. Macaulay says, and you want to question him on it? Or you, and you what Mr. McLeod says? No, I'm not saying anything except ask a question. <laughs> but uh, you please feel free to come in on anything at all. I, I would really like you to feel free after, say, 
a discussion at this meeting. And uh, it is going to center really on the theme of the uh, revival. And what we'll do is we'll look at uh, this uh, generally, Mr. Macaulay will speak about generally, and then home in on uh, the one that he knows so much about, that he's written so well about on the revival in Carlow and his own experiences in it and the experience maybe of others. And some features of it that uh, perhaps uh, we would want to hear about. Now I think that in any kind of discussion of this nature that we have to begin, first of all of course, with the the question, Mr. Macaulay, that uh, much is made really of revival today. How would you define it yourself? Well, revival means uh, bringing in life again, spiritual life again by the Spirit of God. There is no other way for it. Uh, some people, of course, uh, maintain that a long uh, period of prayer brings revival. And others take a different course. I think in the uh, Kilsyth and Cumberland revival that uh, the minister had been preaching a course of doctrine. Now, when Livingston, at the first revival, when it began, he, he, he was there just for the evening and intimated a Monday evening service. That's how the Monday evening began. And uh, uh, the Spirit of the Lord, of course, blessed the uh, uh, service. So what yeah. you're saying is that, that uh, it begins uh, within the church? Oh, the yes, church. within the church. Yeah. I would say within the church. Okay. And through the preaching of the word, it's really a combination of the word of God and the work of the Spirit, because the, the, the word is the sword of the Spirit. It's the Spirit of revival. There's no other way of doing it. Mm-hmm. Sometimes uh, people feel constrained to pray, perhaps for some time, uh, but the setting up, say, of various prayer groups and so on, I. Uh, I'm a bit skeptical about yes. that. Well, in certain areas, in some areas of the country today, and to, I don't want to, to, to be offensive to anybody or tread in anyone's toes, but I know particularly in Wales that uh, there is the tendency to have meetings just for that specific purpose, so nothing else matters but yes. provide within the church. And that's what you're skeptical of. Oh, yes. After all, the primary duty of ministers is to preach the word of God. Mm-hmm. And prayer comes in along with it, but it's not uh, the primary duty. The p- primary duty to, to declare the riches of Christ. Yes. That's the primary. Now, seeing you're, seeing you're on that theme just now, being a product of a revival yourself in Carloway, um, were people praying for the revival then? Was well, I quizzed uh, uh, people. One or two were saying that uh, among the old people that they were, that they were looking for somebody to come, but they had no inkling at all, unless the minister had. Uh, he had certainly refused a call to Ness. I'm not sure that he would have refused a call to Stormy. He almost got it, but McCray... That's right. I know he almost got it. The, the session were for him, but uh, McCray came and preached two excellent sermons, and that was that. History repeated just six years ago. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, the only two sermons I had, but anyway. An, in- <laughs> an interesting feature, which is um, perhaps inexplicable, was that the very first crop that came in Carloway were not too steadfast. Well, I was going to ask you that, actually. Mm-hmm. You've, you've, you've uh, beat me to that very question, actually. But the, the, uh, I was wondering if, if at the time of the revival in Carloway, when, when it started, or prior to it, start leading up to it. What about church attendance? What, what, what things, was there a spirit of anticipation? Ah, no, was no, 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 uh, there was no increase in, no. No, until the revival started. It's so from that point of view, there was no evidence that anything was no, Oh, no, not, not from, uh, from the ordinary people coming, more, more of them coming to church. There was no evidence of that. But would it be, th- would it be a right question to ask you then, is w- were people sort of taken by surprise mm-hmm. when it happened? Well, I should say they were taken by surprise because of a certain individual who were, co- who were, who were converted. Yes. I see. Uh, the Carlwood district was not... Uh, uh, was your own conversion a surprise to people? 
or more than likely, because I was the leader of all every other uh, evil thing that was going. You were a leader even then. A leader even then. I was. I actually made the fruit pulp, which which they have today in Galway, put the net on it, and never played a game. Uh, one of the elders who who has died, who was in Galway, came over to me and said to me, "I." Wouldn't be surprised though you would never play a game on it, and I didn't. So he uh, maybe he was seeing something. Uh, well, if he wasn't, I was. I was feeling that I just had uh -huh. to give it up, and I hung up my football boots and didn't go uh, to play anymore. The same with badminton. We had a badminton club in Carlow then, and the same with many other things, right. which I'm not going to divulge. But you were well, you could switch <laughs> the mic off. Just, uh, <laughs> 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 um, so you were there for, were you the revival Oh no, I wasn't at the beginning, there was a number of starters yeah, before I started. You must have been feeling, you were feeling something uh, at that time. Well, not at the very beginning, no. I was uh, actually playing over at Rouge uh, with the team. I was the captain of the team. And I was playing what, position, what position did you play there? <laughs> <laughs> At Ruth that time I was playing outside left, I think, but I, I normally played centre. Uh, but uh, uh, some of the fellows who were with me in school were over there, and I was visiting actually with Mortimer McLeod, who was out in Coward uh, down the Clyde. There he was uh, an old man, and he was with me in school. And he was uh, he and Mortimer Matheson were in charge of the football uh, in Ruth at that time. And uh, Mortimer McLeod's father, the go. You remember Ben Hallam Go, her father too, in Bernda. Yeah. Well, some of the people in Carl yes, would know yes. He asked me about the revival in Carlway. Now, a few had started at that time, and I said to him, Well, this fellow uh, lost his mother, and this fellow was ill, and this fellow was this, and this fellow was that. But there's one person who said, I can't understand why he started. <laughs> <laughs> you had your reasons for them starting. And the, the old man said quietly, oh, I understand you very well. <laughs> I see you coming here. <laughs> but I was telling what I was feeling. But he knew that I just didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> I see. Could I, I know that this would interest certainly in some of the young people here just now. At that stage in your own life, were you wanting to be converted? Or were you afraid that you would be converted? No, I wasn't wanting to be converted. I wasn't thinking of it at all. I, I, I went to church, I regularly went to church, and uh, I remember, I think it was Mackay Shopper who said something about, uh, oh, you're here and you're saying that you, uh, whoever will be converted, you won't be converted. And, you know, I, and that's just what I was saying at the time. <laughs> you didn't want it? No, I didn't want it. Didn't see any need of it at that time. Uh -huh. But then I was ill uh, uh, at that time. I was ill. I was off for about a year, uh, and uh, I promised relatives that I would go over to the communion at point. But I was going secretly. I wasn't going to tell anyone. I, I wasn't looking for a conversion or anything. But by the time that by the t I went over, the place there was no other conveyance. By the time I reached up Kirivik uh, way, quite a number of the young converts going to the communion at point were in there. And by the time we reached point, I was singing with them all the time, and I didn't turn back since then. Yeah. It is a very peculiar uh, beginning. And I was at that communion, and I hadn't gone to the prayer meeting. But I went on Thursday, when I came back. From the communion? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's see. That's, That's the communion I described in my book. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So, I thought that with, with, with the revival having started, say, a few years before you started yourself, that... Well, not a few years, just two. Well, two, two years. Two. Well, they say that, that there is so much, there is such a presence of the Spirit in reviving, the extraordinary presence of the Spirit, that, that people who aren't convert at all feel of that there, is no, uh, there is no question about that. That is uh, quite true. And not only do they feel the presence, the atmosphere as they called it, but they feel when it goes away. 
he noticed that. I was speaking to one man, I used to go to, the, I was in the terriers at the time, and uh, uh, one boy who was with me in the terriers told me that he, he used to go to these meetings, and he wasn't converted. He said, I would stay there listening to them till seven o'clock in the morning. And another fellow in Carlow told me that he would notice the difference when the, when the atmosphere changed, as it does sometimes in meetings like that that a coldness comes in, an indifference. Spirit as if it was withdrawing from the meeting. I see. So they would be aware of that? Yes, they, they, can, they, the they could feel that. Mm -hmm. Well, you see, the, uh, it's, I think it's quite understandable when the spirit is present, the emotions are moved, that's clear. Yes. And uh, when things go flat, they would notice the difference. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, in Carlo itself, was even in your own report, the book, a lot of people, I can't remember the exact numbers, he would be, would, were converted. Would you have had many instances of people who didn't continue? No, we didn't have a, a many instances. We had one or two later on, uh, but not many, no, we didn't. But you see, when the, uh, when the revival began, there were cottage meetings everywhere. And it depends on where they were that night. The whole crowd, they came from Tulskakulis, from everywhere, and in Priestlitz as well, the same, the movement was in Priestlitz at the same time. And uh, it was slightly different from the, from, uh, the way it uh, worked in Carloway. In the Priestlitz one wasn't just the same. There was uh, more questioning in the Carloway end uh, about points of doctrine and things like that. Mm -hmm. than there was in the other. I'm not trying to depreciate the Priestly people mm -hmm. because they, they were the same, but uh, there were more uh, questions arising among the youth that were in Carnival. McKeever maintained that they, they were the most intelligent youth in uh, the island at that time, and he was not alone in that. <laughs> so, so you care as you. No, <laughs> no, I, no I, I, well, perhaps I do, but I didn't know. Uh, the, those, who, those who, who came over at the elections maintained that they got the most intelligent questions from the Carlow district. <laughs> I'm not That's trying true. to say Maybe they were more politically motivated than people <laughs> in the But I think the people... No, but they were more intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was probably born out in, 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 after, in after years where in Christian company have come in it. So these men were noted for the... Well, it depends. Thing. I think the intelligence there, the craft they had there, there, there the schoolmaster they had in Briasclet uh, came down to Carlwood, and his stress was mainly on mathematics. He wasn't teaching English, he was teaching Latin and mathematics, and of course navigation. When I went to the Nicholson, I was up to the third year in navigation before I went there from Carlwood at that time. And the, the star in mathematics when I was in the Nicholson, from class six down to or class two or one, came from Carlow or Priestley, because of the overstress on mathematics, and the English star uh -huh. went to to the point people because of the overstress on the English and not not on the on the mathematical side. I see. Yes, it was very peculiar, but it. Uh, it's only a tall go to Ness and Brisbane. Oh well, of course. <laughs> Ness was different. In, in fact, there was a movement in Ness before, long before it was in Carlow, through Roddy McLeod, oh, yes. Yes. as Mrs. Finlayson is a product, knows very well. Yes. Now, mm. in both these revivals, you, you mentioned you've brought in Ness now and Carlow. It seems to me that preaching played a large part. Oh, preaching the main part. Uh -huh. The main part. Yes. I preaching the main part. The whole emphasis was on, on, oh, the on whole preaching. Oh, the whole emphasis was on preaching and teaching, yes. And when you met like that, you met, you met in these cottage meetings to which everyone gathered. Oh, well, that was merely for praying. Yes, and then and discussion. Discussion, discussion, discussion which was very important. Very discussion. Important. And mm. based on what was being taught, what was being preached very often. What was often. being preached very often. Mm -hmm. yes. I often, I sometimes went to church after uh, to listen to Mr. McKeever. Norman MacLeod and myself would be discussing a certain question in uh, in a house in Carloway. Here the minister would come out with the very things we were discussing. And one Sabbath he came out with it and was against what we were saying. And we were sure that this man had told him. 
Jeg har ikke til mørkt og stødt slags mand med et sted for mig. Vi den til den kalde mand til. Så the next Sabbath, I don't know whether he, to- he told him then, he turned around the other view, you see, the other side of the question. Yes. Because the, the minister had to, uh, he had really hold of the, the, the mind, pulse, of the the pulse of the people. Of the people. Yes, which is very important. So how was he able to do that? Was was he in a, was he part of the fellowship with you? Was oh no. Uh, well, sometimes he was. Sometimes he was. There was, a, uh, there was an old lady just up beside me there, and um, sometimes he had to go to the Church of Scotland to listen to the husband of a sister, brother-in-law, John Mackay, John Knox. Oh, yes. And of course she hated to go to Church of Scotland, Miss McIver, because McIver was an idol. And uh, uh, this night she, she was looking after her, her aged mother. And this night she, uh, we went up after the meeting and we started of course pulling her legs saying that oh, he was really wonderful tonight. Of course who, 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 who came in on the door but the minister. And she immediately said to him, I'll say this in Gaelic, I let me know how to go to the school I think you're going to extremes when I'm not there. <laughs> I see. Yes. Um, <coughs> no. But that's the feeling, uh, excuse me. Yes. That's the feeling that anyone had who was prevented from going to these meetings, that they lost an overload. You're right? missing something. Missing something. Yes. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. I see. Maybe that wouldn't be a bad thing for the, for us all to carry with us if we could. Oh have, yes, indeed. You know, mm-hmm. adopt that attitude. Yes, in indeed. Um, oh, there are always a lot. Move from your heart to your mouth when you feel it. No, the other thing that is striking about revivals when you read about, especially revivals in this island, is that they, they, they all have their own particular feature. They seem to have. Yes, and some districts didn't have them. And some districts didn't have them at all. Yes. Now, were there any features that were peculiar, would you say, to the revival in Carnival? Uh, no, I wouldn't say there were any. Well, at the very end of the revival, actually, a busload went down to uh, Shadr Bavas, where there were people waving their hands up in the air and going out for the count. And they, some of them took that back with them to the meetings in Carlway. But so far as I know, no one was converted after that in the revival. Sure. Yes, it had come to an end. Would, would the minister express a view on that? Say? Well, Mr. McKeever actually he told me he was over in Cotopus and I was, I was at the, listening to him. And there were then uh, there were two special lame girls who were flinging their hands above and going out for the count and they were being carried out from the meeting to the mound just above the, the Crossopost Church. And Mr. McKeever told me that he, he didn't uh, interfere with his service in any way. The fact that they, were, that they were even carried out. That he didn't lose his liberty over them in any way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he wasn't for or against what was happening. He didn't say, he didn't say anything, didn't say anything about it. I mm-hmm. uh-huh. And I think that's all Mr. Wise thing to do. In a case like that, if you don't know what's caused it. I see. Mm-hmm. Well, just let it be. Let it be. It'll, these frills will soon die down and the real thing will come to the surface. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, may I ask this one? I'm going to give the chance to people who want to come in here after I ask this question. And by all means, please feel free to make a comment or address a question because it's it's a very interesting and a very important and fascinating subject. Just to, to put a date on this, you know, what year was it? That's all. Well, it began 34, 35, I think. There were a f- just a few before then, odd here and there, uh, say about four a year being added to the communion roll, uh, two at each communion, regularly since Mr. McKeever came. But uh, the actual revival began 34, 35. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The, the to, to 39. The, I, when I came back from the war, the first thing I noticed was as soon as they got out, they were making straight for home. A number of couples had to become engaged or were thinking of getting married, and off they went with them. All 
student revival, they always gathered in, in bunches outside the church, discussing what they did, you know, what they are carried or something like that. But after the war, when I came back from the war, I knew the revival was finished because of the way the peace was scattering immediately after the service. Mm-hmm. A sign of coldness. There's something I don't like myself, I must say, but anyway, the, mm-hmm. for those of you who were in a revival, has it coloured your, say just now, your, your prayer, um, praying for revival? Well, of course, everyone doesn't start the same. Some people, I remember one boy in Carloway before I was converted, and before he was actually converted too, and uh, we occasionally... I had a bottle of beer and I gave him half a glass of beer and he started praying. I was looking at the man in the amazement and then saying, I'm going to see this girl. <laughs> he had every word that his mother was saying, his mother was a widow, every word that she was saying at the worship, he had it off by heart and it came out with just half a glass of beer and that's about all he could stand. <laughs> no, but after, after, as a result of all like, these experiences in revival, um, how does it, do people who are in a revival, do they tend to pray always for another revival? If, uh, if they, yes, they tend to pray for another revival, an outpouring of the Spirit of God. Mm-hmm. And uh, they're looking and waiting to see if they can experience once again those things which they experienced in the revival. I often told them at back that they couldn't understand what a revival was until it came. And it's only then that they, it yeah. did come yeah. and that they re- realized what, it was. what the difference was. Not what it was, but what the difference was between the ordinary meetings and the times of revival. Times of refreshing. Yeah. Times of refreshing. Now, the, the, may I ask this? There are some people, I know that this is a, a reaction. I've heard this myself from some people. And I don't know if it's because of the emphasis that is placed upon revival or to the exclusion of almost everything else in some circles. And you do tend to get that. And some people react against that and say this, that they, they don't believe they should pray for revival. That they, they, they should just be satisfied with the, what they would call the ordinary work of the Spirit and in blessing the Gospel and, well, one or two come in, that's the word Carl with the revival, one or two come in, on a regular basis, that's fine. And why want more? What does the Word of God say? What were they doing in Pentecost uh, on the day of Pentecost? They were of one mind praying mm-hmm. to God. They were praying, but they had to be dependent on the time of the decree. Mm-hmm. We're praying for the outpouring of the Spirit. Uh, praying for the outpouring of the Spirit. And I think the Christian is always looking for. Mm-hmm. Uh, He's longing for more converts, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, he, of course, tries to bend his will to the will of God, which is not sometimes easy. Th- th- that, well, no. May I ask? I was going to ask one question. There's another one now. Um, whether do you think there were evidences whether people, or do you know of instances in which people tried to sort of cash in in a revival by trying to almost use their own agency and use human means to keep going? What God alone could start, what God alone could. On. Well, I don't know how to notice it, uh, but uh, I think some of that had come in down in Shadow in the Barvest district. You know, the a fellow black, I think, came up from Greenock. I think, I think I knew myself with a, some box or other that they were using. I don't know what it was. And uh, it caused a great division in, in the Barvest congregation, a split that it was never healed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, uh, not to, no. Uh, there were a few in show, but just very few. It was strong in locks as a whole, right over from Crossopus uh, to Graver and uh, the, the whole of the district. I don't think it was a pack at that time, but it was strong in point, very strong in point. And uh, it wasn't strong in Stoneway at all. McCray was against it, and especially against uh, uh, those who were appeared to be 
uh, disturbing the meetings. Meeting. Actually, it was a very peculiar thing. These those who seemed to be passing out were not passing out at all. They heard every word when they were stretched on the seats. They were stretched on the seats there and heard every word that was being said and appeared to be unconscious, but they weren't. Mm -hmm. There were, there were, the movement in Ethel, of course, was some time before that. And it was at 1920, Mrs. Uh, that's, uh, 19, that's when Roddy MacLeod was uh, well, I, when I was in the Nicholas and I was travelling with Roddy MacLeod to Carlow he was preaching in Carlow I remember him very well uh, he went to Tumba mm -hmm. there, was, there, was, there were no phenomena attached to the accompanying the revival net either were there? Mm -hmm. no, no. Quite no. no except that the elders didn't accept Roddy MacLeod too well because he jumped the fences <laughs> <laughs> Well, of course, this is a feature of all revivals. Uh, most of those who take statistics, if they know them, but they just say that uh, the large percentage of converts accept Christ before they are 30. And uh, I, I was telling them this at back once, that most of the people were converted before they were 30 and then lesser still before they were 40 and lesser still before they were 50 and then I shouted if you're over that you're too late <laughs> the sermon was in Gaelic but these two words were in English and a man was converted by the words too late was he over 50? yes he was <laughs> that's how he began <laughs> Coming back to Carloway, now, there were no children converted in that. Were there any children in that revival? Well, it depends on what you call children. Yes, my own sister was only 16 now. 16? Yes. But so that, that was very much the exception to the rule. No, no, there were quite a lot of young people. Uh, oh, fairly young, yes. Mm -hmm. But there have been very few young converts prior to the revival. Oh, very few. Mm -hmm. Very few. Uh -huh. yes. So, you'll have seen and you'll be able to assess that perhaps better than most people know uh, the, trans the difference between the attitude or the number of the young people connected to the church today and yeah. the number of young people connected to the church in the 20th and century. And you must remember in, in my young days most of the young people went to church. They're not like those today. They today they stay inside. They probably look at the television though I don't see them but I, I suspect that they're looking at the television. And uh, in any case, they don't go to church, the young people. Compared to what was in Oh, people. no, the young, most of the young people went to church, in my opinion. I see. Yeah. But what I'm saying is that there weren't all that many young people, the uh, members of the church. No, the there, there weren't. There weren't actually. Mo uh, uh, when Callum Williams started, he began in 1928. And he was an exception. He had been ill, and he was, he was an exception. Of course, he went in for the mission later on. Now, uh, at that time, he used to go to the to the uh, uh, Shaw Communion. Of course, Cullinish then belonged to Carnway. It was part of the Carnway congregation. We used to go to the to the uh, Shaw Post Communion. Everyone, not not the converted people, everybody yes, went, who used to go to church, they went to the Shaw Communion, and the Shaw people came up. Mm -hmm. Any other? Co there were a few young people in Nesbos, isn't it? Oh, yes, quite a number. A number of children? Uh, yes. Donald MacDonald would be only nine, was it? Or no, eleven? No. Yes. Eleven, was it? No, he was thirteen. Thirteen, yeah, was it? Thirteen, I, uh, thirteen, I think. Uh, in his book. Yes. And Mr. Morrison. He was in that revival of Fred McClure. Uh-huh. Colin Morrison. How old was he then? Uh, he was older. older. Yes, he was old. So that, that, there's a difference. Now, there were more children in this in the revival. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not sure how many, whether uh, any children in the Priyaskleta and Tulsa Hulish, but there were a lot of young people. A lot of young people in Priestley, a lot of young people all over. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Any other contribution you wish to make, a question you wish to ask? <laughs> On this most, most <coughs> interesting subject. Could I ask you, the first, the first fruits that were not steadfast. The what? The first fruits weren't steadfast. No, it's a delicate subject. You, I can't answer that. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to mention the names of who the, these people were. But they weren't so steadfast. I think the Priyaslet people will know. But uh, the one in particular that was in Priyaslet, uh, and he was extremely bright at that time, and ahead of most people in, in knowledge and doctrine, that he went back years after that. Uh, I don't know what did he take to think, I'm not very certain, but there was nothing else in his life so far as I know. And one or two like that down our way too, who weren't just so steadfast as, as the next group that came. Now, I think I told in my book that at that time the great difficulty was that we would be called on to pray. And we were called, I was called to pray in, in the prayer meeting in, in, in the church before I became a member. Yes. In yes, in the, in the morning prayer meeting, and the place was full. Now, uh, a number of the second group, a number of them, uh, uh, we gathered in an empty house that was there, and we we didn't let any ladies in, just to learn how to pray. Did you know that? I would have thought that you could have let them in because they would have, they would have helped you by criticizing Of course, if you had been there, yes. <laughs> 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 no, they weren't allowed in, and even the older Christians didn't allow them in except one that could take charge of the meeting. <laughs> so that you would learn to pray? What we'd learn to pray. Did you Oh, there were many hypocrites so far as that was concerned. <laughs> Well, that's interesting. It's interesting, and uh, I remember I went to that prayer meeting, and I, I could disclose today wh- what happened, I didn't in my book, but we were in that prayer meeting, and um, I was I had strung a number of uh, texts together, which I could feel of, and I was called on first to prayer, and so I did feel them all. <laughs> and just when I sat, this fellow got up and said, who do you think is going to pray after that? (laughs) 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 That was quite true. (laughs) How was it that? Because it it was a most unusual thing for a man who wasn't a member to be called to pray in a prayer meeting. Ah, it was an elder who was beside me that called called on me. Was he disciplined? Oh, certainly <laughs> not. <laughs> you see, we, we were praying in every in, in all the in, the house, in, in yes. all the houses. Uh, we were praying in the meetings in the houses, but we weren't praying. What in morning? What, what kind of mo- mo- early meeting is that? Oh, the, we we still have it. A prayer meeting in the morning before the service. Oh, Sabbath morning. Sabbath morning. Oh, I see. Oh, yes. Yes, always. Mm-hmm. Yes. So that was the end of the prayer meeting. Did someone else stand up after you then? Oh, yeah. Oh, 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 not the the black was in the private prayer meeting. You see. Yes, I know. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that wasn't the end of the prayer meeting. No, no. No, we didn't end with that. Mm. But it shows you the, how weak we were in an our understanding of prayer at <laughs> that time. But yeah. obviously it was, a, it was an encouragement. You were encouraging one another. Of course we were encouraging one another and uh, they were getting practice and learning texts of scripture and things like that and they were questioning scripture all the time questioning sermons and questioning everything uh, and discussing that in the uh, in the homes yes of course yes. Well, after, after your own conversion when you came back from these communions in point and you went to the prayer meeting in Carloway yes. did you did you feel then may I ask you did you feel then the desire to preach no and I'll tell you why I told you well, I told in my book, or somebody told me. There, there was a lady who was then beside me, just about a hundred yards from our house, where she, uh, when I was born, who said that I was to be a preacher of the gospel. Uh, when I was born. 
And uh, of course, they got to know this. And when I was a, a, a young boy, they started calling me Murkhuminishya. <laughs> and this, of course, riled me. And I was running down a house. We were uh, over visiting, uh, well, around the house. A lady there, she was in bed. And when she heard them calling me Murkhuminishya, and she rebuked me and told me not to lay that down as a pillow. And instead of encouraging me to go for the ministry, it did the very opposite. I tried to restrain myself from going and didn't actually uh, decide to go till I went to Germany, and that's another story. Mm -hmm. was, it, was it there that you, that you succumbed to the call? Oh, to the Germany. call of the ministry, yes. In Germany? Oh, yes. I see. Yes. Yeah. Anyone want to come in? <coughs> I would like to ask Mr. McCauley when he preached his first sermon. Can you remember when he preached his first sermon? Yes, I can remember well. When I was a student in Edinburgh, Mr. MacLeod, the evangelist, was then in Greenock. He was a chaplain to the forces as well at the time. And of course, uh, he, he and I were married to the two sisters. And he phoned me up and said, I have to go away. He said, you take the three services tomorrow. <laughs> I started protesting and he put down the phone. I didn't know what on earth to do. Well, I had one sermon that I heard MacLeod Donoch preaching on Nicodemus, and I had it off by heart. <laughs> but well, I had you are now in the first, you had a prayer off by heart, then you had a sermon off by heart. <laughs> but I had two more to give. And funnily enough, I was preaching in Prague this year, for last year. And one of the girls there, Janet Gray, she was out visiting her sister in Greenock. And she met this woman in Greenock, and she asked about me, and told her the first time when I preached there. She was listening, and so was her brother. I remember the tears coming from his eyes. He, that was the missionary in Skye, Neil Cameron. Oh, yes. Neil Cameron. And oh. <laughs> that was Neil Cameron who said to Alistair McCaskey, I wish I could get a real Christian's heart. And McCaskey said to him, If you got that, you would find that it was wor worse than the one you have. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So you preached in Kinnock? Preached three sermons. And I was terrified going into the pulpit. And just as I pulled the door of the pulpit behind me, everything left me, all fear. And I preached Nicodemus. <laughs> yes, that was my beginning. Mm -hmm. Quite interesting. Yes. When, that was, when was that? Been? 40? That was in 45. 45? Yes. You had gone to college? I had gone to the college, yes. Mm -hmm. I went to the college in 45. Uh -huh. had you, had you ever had, did you ever have opportunity to preach? your fellow prisoners in, in Germany? Oh no, we had chaplains, a number of chaplains. I went over one day to... I went over to visit uh, the Dean of Peterhouse in Cambridge. He was a godly man, but uh, I wouldn't say he was sound in doctrine. But I was going to ask him about predestination. And when I went over there, there were six or eight chaplains with a piper trying to learn how to dance the quadrilles. <laughs> That was predestination, you were. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite true. Yes, Scot Scotland, uh, chaplains from Scotland. And they looked at me and I looked at them. <laughs> and you didn't ask so. him? Oh, I did ask him, and he was wise enough to say, I believe it is it, but I'm not fit to deal with something. I see. Yes. So you would never, you wouldn't have had the opportunity to, to, to preach yourself. Oh no, I wasn't preaching. No, so, no, I had to, no, I had no opportunity to preach. I didn't want to preach there at that time. No. Mm -hmm. But I told you already the my Bible and everything. Yeah. Uh, but they don't know that. Ah well. Well, I think it would be very interesting even for to end on that note because I think it's a very touching story and uh, 
well worth hearing. Some of you may know that Mr. Macaulay was taken prisoner at the very, at the very near the beginning of the of the war, so he can tell you what happened. That well, I'm very, example. I'm very reluctant to tell it because it's so personal, and um, because people think that when I tell it, that just uh, that I'm trying to make myself big. I wish I could make myself smaller and smaller and smaller till the very end. But three years before the war started, I had a vision of an angel which Angel of the Covenant coming to my bed. I never saw such a specimen of pure humanity uh, in my life. And he asked me a question, where is Germany? And I saw the map of Europe stretched out on the Fiamak stone there and I pointed to him, there is Germany, I said. And he said to me, well, I am going there. And he went away. Three years before the war, and I told it to, to the people uh, we, we used to mix with. I never understood it, I couldn't understand it until I went to France and to Germany. When I went to France I told my troop, I saw in my sleep that I would be taken prisoner, that I wouldn't be killed. And I told my troop, I won't be killed, I'll be taken prisoner. And this may be difficult for some of you to believe, but it doesn't matter. But. Uh, when we came, we were then that was six months before I was captured. We went down to the Tsar, and of course that was a period of idleness. We weren't doing very much, and I used to have these boys out and, and have worship with them, uh, and uh, they were Camelton boys, and uh, I had worship with them, and uh, then the word came, of course, that the Germans had broken through in the north at the Somme, and so we were called back up there to St. Valery. And I was one day, uh, just before we came to that stage, there was a boy there, uh, I, I was going to a couple and I was going to show him where to place a gun. And just when we were going over the fence, I heard a shot and I, I had a, only a revolver. And I just got my revolver, I thought it was a sniper that was above me, I was going to shoot him. <laughs> but when I heard them, the, the fellow, when he went over the, men's, uh, the, the fence, he there he was lying and jumping about and shouting. The catch on the on the rifle he had had broken some time ago. He hadn't reported it, and it went right through his leg. There came out in the, in the sole of the boot. I took that shoe, and he had two other brothers in the, in the, in the regiment, and gave it to them as an heirloom. I don't know whether they have it yet or not. But uh, the boy, fortunately enough, my don't my. Uh, or my, yes, my Donar, Donar means dispatch rider. He had seen a hospital that day. And I bandaged, I, we carried all with a bandage here, which we only used in, uh, in an emergency. And I bandaged that fellow's foot as well as I could and sent him away to a hospital with that, uh, with that driver. When I came back from the war, that fellow was a captain. I was still a lieutenant as I was. <laughs> <laughs> he was only a corporal then. He got away, went to the hospital, and he went away, got to England after his leg got better. 
Uh, we were then got, got the order when we came up to St. Valerie there. That was at the uh, outskirts of St. Valerie. We got the order to... Uh, no, I saw... I was. We were out before we went into St. Valerie. I saw one of my gun crews coming with the truck and no gun. I didn't know nothing. I, I said, oh, what, what is wrong? Who told you to come here? He said that a, a dispatch rider came and told us to clear out of here, that we, uh, that we should retire. Well, I said, that's very strange. I didn't hear a word. And just then, a, a truck was passing with six generals in it. And I had the audacity to go out and stop them and find out about this. And they said, it may ve very well be true, we don't know. Of course, they knew very well that they were just about to retire. So that gun was left there that night. We got word to retire and we had to leave that gun. And uh, we were going to St. Valerie. And when we went to St. Valerie, I had to go back with that gun again with another uh, captain, uh, George Lewis, and the uh, man who was driving the man. And we saw that dispatch rider he made off as soon as we arrived at a crossroads. But we got the gun and came back. And when we got the gun, it was two o'clock the next day before I came back and I was just famishing. I didn't have I hadn't anything to eat for t two days, and um, I had been given orders to go out and plant my four guns straight away. Without o they had taken their, their dinner, and I didn't get a thing, neither did uh, those who were with me. I had to go out and plant down these four guns, and as soon as I planted these guns, there was a big shadow just a wee bit away from me, about a hundred yards or two hundred yards. So I went down to see if I could find any food in that house. All I found was one lump of sugar. I ate that and went out. I wasn't a hundred yards away when it went up in Snibberines. Had I got anything there, to s I would have sat down and ate it and go up with it. And then the order came, of course, to retire into St. Valerie, to let our trucks run without oil or water so that there wouldn't be of any use to the Germans. The Germans didn't want them, they had plenty. We were told that they had cardboard tanks, but that's not what they had. And uh, uh, when I was hoping that I could get away with my men then uh, and make for England, because we were, it was in Valerie was on the shore, you see, but we couldn't, the guns, the German guns were covering everything and no boat could come in. And we, could, we weren't allowed to take a small boat and go over, weren't allowed to move. And in the morning, I was going out at the beginning of the column. I was really downhearted that time. Uh, those who went off with my truck, the truck I was saying, they went off with the truck. Never saw, I didn't see them. I didn't know what had happened to them. And all my stuff was in that truck. My Bible, my new shaven kit, my new uh, dress, officer's dress, and ev everything that I possessed was there except the battle dress that I had on. And uh, going as a prisoner, and I hadn't got a stitch. Uh, the laws who were at headquarters, they had huge packs, and they were just throwing things out on the side of the road. And I was picking up, as were others too, picking up what they threw out, so that I would have a shift of clothes. Now, when we when we went outside Saint Valerie, there, we were told to break your compasses and revolvers and uh, everything that could be of use to the Germans. Huh? I was there breaking down my. Uh, compass, my revolver and my binoculars with my heel like that when this big sergeant came over to me and said to me this is what you told us six months ago in uh, Atasom that you would be taken prisoner and although I had it written in my notebook in my diary I had forgotten it and I just turned away and cried that the world should know what God had revealed to me and that I hadn't kept it properly before my mind. Now, that's not all. That night, when I went out a bit further, somebody came over to me and said, your boys are on the other side of the road. I hadn't seen them. I didn't know where they went. Uh, we were separated. You see, the officers were put in apart from the, the rest. And so I went over and one of them gave me a shaving uh, brush and another gave me a razor and uh, one or two things like that. But this fellow came with this. He said, uh, this was my driver who had gone away with the truck. Uh, no, it was my donor. I'm sorry, I'm keeping you. No, keep. no. uh, 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 this was my donor, uh, the dispatch rider. He said, 
the driver is said plunked right into a cow and uh, killed it and uh, we thought we were going to get away and the Germans caught us. So when uh, the Germans caught us they took us away and when we were 200 yards or so away I asked him permission to go back to the truck for something special. And I went, well, the chairman car said, well, be careful, if you go back, I'm keeping an eye on you. Yes, he tried to, to escape, you see. So he went back, didn't take a single thing that belonged to me from that truck, but my garlic pipe. And that night he said to me, I knew that that was the most precious thing you had in the truck. And that was the textbook. Thirty-three languages were taught in the camp where I was in 1942. Thirty-three languages were taught there. And that Gaelic Bible was the only Gaelic textbook we had. But each Gaelic was among them. And I have that Bible still. So that's uh, the story of the... Perhaps it was worth hearing to some Well, no, friends, that's a very appropriate note on which to draw this session and which it probably this conference to a close because it brings very forcibly before our minds the sovereignty and the goodness and the great loving kindness of our God. So we'll close now with worship. We'll sing, I don't know if the Reverend Norman here is present, is he? He had intended to, but maybe he didn't manage. He's not present, is he? Oh, that I did. Yes, I will not disagree. Well, we'll sing it. Just now in Psalm 89, <coughs> at verse 5, the praise of thy wonders, Lord, the heavens shall express, and in the congregation of saints thy faithfulness. For who in heaven with the Lord may once himself compare? who is like God among the sons of those that mighty are. We sing four verses, Psalm 89 at verse 5, The praise of thy wonders, Lord, the heavens shall express.
to whom this wasn't true below, those who, to whom this hadn't happened before, has happened to them this weekend, and really, this is where I have to play second fiddle again. I know that uh, some of them have fallen in love with Mr. Macaulay, and, uh, but if I survive him, maybe you'll fall in love with me then. <laughs> now, I know that they would love to have a few minutes with him, and he would love to have a few minutes with them, because I know him quite well, and uh, I know that. So what you'll do is, after this uh, singing, and after this session, while others move around and others go back and such, and you go into that wee room on your left hand side at the hotel entrance there. Uh, I don't think there's any curtains on the window, we can't draw the curtains. So you can have a short discussion with my colleague and ask him whatever you wish. And uh, I'm sure that he will give you culture, which will be of great benefit to you. So there you are, and you older people, don't spoil them. Please. Pardon? Well, you're not allowed anyway. <laughs> and no one in my congregation is allowed. <laughs> <laughs> and that's an order. <laughs> and I'll make my DR make sure that that's carried out. What do you call the dispatch rider? What do you call the dispatch rider? DR. He's been renamed. <laughs> <laughs> From now on, he is our dispatch rider. <laughs> and now, there are just two intimations I have to sing the last uh, few verses of Psalm 122. You weren't present, Mr. Morrison, tell the writer, when thanks was expressed to you and your staff this afternoon. I would like to be present to express that thanks now publicly with greatly indebted. Psalm 122, Nana Salam Harinia Peter. August has Alan Alan in She the son of a to Jerusalem. He's going out